Britain's government to protect at least 30% of them by 2030 from industrial fishing, mining and drilling. The Environment Secretary, Michael Gove, has told Sky News that Lewis has shown inspirational leadership and grit. So, Lewis's journey began on the 12th of July at Land's End in Cornwall. He headed straight from Lizard's Point. Its treacherous waters were his first major challenge. After a brief stop in his hometown of Plymouth, Lewis took advantage of the unusually hot weather. But as the weather took a turn for the worse at Dungeness, so did his optimism as he got stuck and had to change course, finally making it around on his third attempt. Well, now he's on the home straight and aims to reach us here at the finish line in just over an hour's time. If he does, he'll do it in 49 days. That is one day less than he planned. Here then is his highs and his lows. I don't think I've done one swim in 31 years where somebody hasn't come up beforehand and said this swim is impossible. You will never ever make it. And it's not that I'm going out there to prove them wrong, but there is a, a certain satisfaction at the end when you do achieve it and you, and you say, yeah, that is possible. We can start pushing the boundaries of human endurance. He's gonna have to tackle the freezing cold water, also the possibility of sunburn, of course. He's going to swallow a huge amount of seawater, and there he goes. Just around the corner over there is Lizard Point. It's one of the most dangerous places in the whole of UK waters. Loads and loads and loads of jellyfish. You've been stung, yeah? Uh, yep. Between the legs. One hour twenty, you covered three k's. No. And yesterday we were covering six k's in that time. Go for it, guys. <laughs> you look out now, it's the mill pond, and you just can't convey what's actually happening in the water. It's all these whirlpools. You get into the one, and then you're literally swimming sideways. Swimming is the only sport where you're rotating three axes. So your head is moving to the right, right arms are moving from the right, and you're moving down, and you've got to go back in a way. Oh, really good. Oh, that's really good. Look at the pain is there, there, <laughs> and there. Let's go. nearly 500 kilometers from Land's End and we've been stuck over here off Dungeness, the final cape, for two days. Whoa! I'm absolutely determined now somehow to get around this point and once I'm around this point then we're on the home stretch. Yeah, most of us don't fancy that. Let's see if one person does. Former competitive swimmer Mark Foster, who represented Great Britain in the Olympics and elsewhere, obviously. Uh, five Olympic Games, no doubt. Do you fancy that? It looks horrific, as far as I'm concerned, as a non-swimmer. Um, to be fair, I'd have gone around the whole of the UK. I wouldn't have just done a lot of it. <laughs> <I'm a bit laughs> like, no, it looks, it looks horrendous. Uh, I must admit, when we got here earlier, it looked quite calm in the water and we were getting battered up here. So I think the thing is, we both said we'd rather be in... Well, I said I'd rather be in there than here. Yeah. But no, what he's done is, is amazing. You Absolutely know, 340 amazing. miles. I mean, I used to swim an awful lot as a kid, up and down a swimming pool, but you don't take any elements. Yes, exactly. And the elements have been horrific, haven't they? Not yeah. least things, for example, like the jellyfish, which I have to say I have paranoid childhoods from, I have to... <laughs> But he's been battling through them, sometimes not even being able to get into the water because of the jellyfish blooms that are there. Yeah, and I know we spoke to some of the guys from the environment, environmental um, agencies earlier, yeah. and they were talking why there are so many jellyfish in the sea nowadays, because we're taking all the fish out, and the fish were one of the ones that actually ate jellyfish before. But um, we both had a similar story to, to when we were 
child, and at 10 years of age, I remember watching Jaws, and I got paranoid about swimming in the sea because I thought Jaws was in there waiting for me. I still do 35 years later. Um, but all the jellyfish things, uh, the physical exertion, and the mental side of things, there's an awful lot that's gone into making this so, so difficult for them. Yeah, I'm definitely of that generation who saw Jaws too young, <laughs> and all of this looks horrific, I have to say. Um, but the headlands, the currents, the swells, the, the sea states have all been very problematic for him. You, freestyle was one of the, the strokes you did, mm -hmm. front crawl for those of us who aren't professional. Yeah. Um, he talks about corkscrewing in the water as he swims because of the swell, and just keeping flat is really difficult. Can you understand and talk us through the sort of the physiology of that, really? I mean, I'm not an ocean water swimmer by any stretch of the imagination, but when you talk about uh, all your power comes from your hips anyway and your core, so what, generally what you are doing when you are swimming, you are swimming from side to side, and I think when you are in the sea, what you're trying to do is make every stroke as long as possible, so therefore you're going to take less strokes when you're swimming in the sea. You can't do a normal, what I would say, pull stroke, because obviously your arms on top of the surface, their arms have been knocked around an awful lot. So what you tend to do is put your arm in a little bit deeper and twist your hips a little bit more. I don't know if you can see that whatsoever. I can't see what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but just to try and make things a little bit easier on your body. And actually, it's all about trying to maintain your stroke well, as, as we found out here for 50 days. You know, you're getting in the water after a, a long day swimming when you're sore and your body's knackered and your mind's knackered and you've got to go again. So it's about how you replenish yourself, not only while you're, while you're doing it, but afterwards at the same time. And we saw there some of the images that have been being massaged. Because so without a support network, he wouldn't be able to be able, be able to do what he's doing. Yeah, he even popped into AFC Bournemouth, didn't he, at, at some point. <laughs> um, he set off already, his support vessel is taking him to the start line. The, dis the difficulty for him is the, the distance swarm and the, and the actual position he needs to be in because of the currents and everything. So they have to be very specific about taking him back to where he, he was meant to be to make sure he does indeed swim the channel properly. Okay. Um, but in terms of the calories he burns, 900 calories an hour, 10,000 a day, he says he has a very active mind when he's in the water. Now, I know you said to me you used to do 20 kilometre swims yeah. um, in one day. Well, He's yeah, aimed yeah, as a special 10K day. 10k in the morning, 10k in the afternoon. Okay. That'll be, that'll be, yeah, but so that'll... He, his average, he was averaging, he hoped, 10 kilometres. Sometimes it had to be more, and obviously less because of the weather sometimes. Yeah. But the active mind, how do you talk to yourself while you're doing um, something like that? Well, someone said it to me, and I, I guess lots of you, you take yourself to, to different places. I mean, there was a lot of the time I used to sing. In my head, I was really, really good, by the way. Um, uh, I used to go through stuff that I used to do at school. Bear in mind, I was a school, you know, I was, I'm talking about nine to 15 years of age. So I go about working things out. Uh, and sometimes I used to go to a really, really weird place, which in my head was like a cabin of a plane where I was the pilot of the plane and I, was, I had passengers on board. And I think you take yourself to lots of different places. So you need to, because obviously swimming up and down when you are in pain and you know you've got a distance or you've got a set to do as it was for me, you need to, you need to sort of switch your mind off from what you're doing because otherwise you're going to, God, this is painful, this is a long way. So you've got to have positive talk rather than negative talk. Yeah. He is spent, though, isn't he? Mentally and physically, absolutely spent, and not surprising. And in terms of talking to himself, um, the chef, his chef on board, says that he's prone to a bit of Battenberg. He needs to take 10,000 calories a day in. That's supposed to be three jacket potatoes when he finishes swimming. And occasionally he shouts out thoughts for his blog that he's been writing for Sky News. Occasionally he would just shout out that he wanted Battenberg at the end. <laughs> so they all had to have the Battenberg and the Victoria sponge ready, which is not quite what was the intention in terms of his diet, I think. Anyway, 10,000 calories a day is a lot, certainly. So we saw the pictures then of Lewis getting into support this morning. Just beforehand, he spoke to my colleague, Jonathan Samuels. I'm so, I'm so excited. Excited and relieved. It's been an enormously long swim. As you say, we've been on here for 49 days. We've been at sea for 49 days. You know, I also wasn't sure when I, when I started at Land's End whether I would be able to make it. You know, the world is divided between pioneers and followers. Uh, pioneers do not know whether they're going to be successful in, in their quest. Uh, I hoped, I prayed that I could do it, I did the training to do it, but still it's an awful long way and anything could have happened over those 50 days. Well, our science correspondent Thomas Moore is the man with the best view of all of this. He is on the support boat that will follow Lewis Pugh's every stroke and he's with Lewis now. They took the boat from Dover Marina within the last hour to head out to those exact coordinates we were talking about of where Lewis finished his last uh, bit of the swim yesterday and that's where he'll start from today in under 30 minutes time. And Thomas, I know you've swum with him. You know how hard this is, but he must be pretty chipper despite the weather um, at, at very nearly getting to the end of this. 
Yeah, absolutely, Anna. He is in, in a good mood because he is so close. Adrenaline, of course, lifts uh, any, any kind of uh, depression you might have when you're faced with these conditions. We're about half a mile off, off the cliffs here. Uh, we're just uh, west of Dover. And look who we found. There is Lewis. There is his support boat, the Aquila, uh, in exactly the right. In fact, you can just see him uh, in his speedos, just emerging uh, from below deck there. Uh, there he is uh, stripped off. He's uh, got his swimming cap on, the white cap, uh, and uh, he looks pretty ready to go. Uh, Anna. So um, uh, quite extraordinary that in these conditions uh, he's actually going to go for it. But then, perfectly honest, the water's probably warmer than the air. Yes, and certainly, uh, Thomas. Yes, and certainly, Thomas, we've been talking about how awful it is to be uh, outside. Best to be in the water, because the sea state is pretty good compared with some of the terrible conditions he's swum in and forcing himself to swim in order to keep to this deadline of 50 days. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the, the, uh, the conditions now, there are they're some small waves out here in the channel. They're probably about 20, 25 centimetres. Um, uh, but you can see there that he's uh, prepared to go in. I mean, he has swum in pretty wild conditions over the, the last, uh, last few weeks. Uh, he talks about this being a swim in two stages. The, the first half up to, from Cornwall all the way up to the Isle of Wight, um, it, they were fairly benign, very flat seas, very warm, excellent weather. But since the Isle of Wight, it has been really difficult going. Uh, and in fact, uh, in the gloom out there is Dungeness, uh, where the nuclear power station is. Uh, and that was a headland, the last headland before he got here to Dover. And it took him three days to get round. The tides really didn't work in his favour. He had some, hit some really rough conditions and it was really hard going. Uh, but now uh, he is so close. You can see him there on the stern of the Aquila. Um, this rain is uh, obviously not going to help him, um, but I'm perfectly honest, I didn't think anything is going to get, get in his way now, uh, the last, uh, last two, three miles uh, to Dover. Are we waiting for him, Thomas? Are we going to see him dive in? Uh, it's a, that's a good question. I think they're just trying to find the GPS coordinates. What happens is that uh, to, to follow the, the rules set by the Channel Swimming Association, you have to mark the precise coordinates of where he finished his last swim. And that is the point that he has to dive in and continue. So there is this long, continuous uh, uh, chain that goes all the way from Land's End to Dover here. Uh, and uh, what happens is that Stephen, the skipper, will motor in the right direction towards Dover, and at the right point, he'll give the count. Three, two, one, swim a go. Uh, and that's when uh, Lewis will jump in. Now, we've been told that it could be three minutes until Lewis gets in. We're going to try and reposition ourselves, uh, Anna, to try and get you the best shot. Uh, and uh, you might want to come back to us in a couple of minutes' time. We'll do just that. Thomas Moore, thank you very much indeed. So, stand by. Lewis Pugh is about to take the final of his swims on day 49. Well, joining me now is a man who wanted to reach the same finish line as Lewis. I'm already looking at you sympathetically, I have to say. <laughs> Hayden Welch is the only other swimmer to have attempted it. Didn't quite make it. More on that in a moment. Also here with me is someone who can maybe tell us how it might be possible to put your body and your mind through uh, what Lewis has done and succeed. Greg White teaches celebrities about the art of endurance and is a physical activity expert. Apologies to you in a moment. Let's go straight back. Lewis Pugh has entered the water and he is off the final part of the swimming. Four kilometres to go. He uh, told Thomas um, yesterday that he is absolutely ready for this. Thomas. On our pitches. <laughs> Yeah, I know we're trying to position ourselves out here in some pretty uh, rough conditions. Uh, Lewis is now in the water. You can see him uh, making steady progress uh, towards the coast. Uh, uh, then he'll be following the line all the way back to uh, Dover. Um, he's got a very steady stroke. Uh, when I was swimming with him uh, the other, other week, um, it, it, I was really impressed how steady his pace was. Uh, it is a, um, a style which he's perfected uh, over, over years of swimming in these conditions. Uh, and there you can see his white hat. He wears a white hat with, hat with the UN Environment logo on it. 
Um, and uh, he likes to swim alongside the boat. That's where Stephen the skipper likes to keep him because these are dangerous waters. There are people, people who die while trying to cross over to, uh, to France uh, and they do like to keep a very close eye on him uh, as he's making his way alongside the boat there. And tell us about how he deals with the temperature of the water, Thomas. Yeah, I mean, and he's used to much colder temperatures than this. Uh, when I was with him up in the Arctic uh, last year, he was swimming along the edge of the Arctic ice pack, uh, and the temperature there was minus 0 0.7 degrees, and he swam in it for 23 minutes. The temperature of the water here is about 18, 19, warmer than, uh, than usual because of the very hot summer that we've had, so that's to his benefit. But he has a very thick layer of, of fat around him. It's, that's what open water swimmers tend to do, uh, to build up that fat layer. It provides them with insulation. So the simple exercise of, of swimming uh, means that they retain that body heat for much longer. Uh, and in fact, when I was in the water, it didn't feel that cold. He's a lot darker than I am. Um, so uh, he, he would just won't feel it, even if he's swimming for two or three hours. I'm just reading from his blog, uh, Thomas, that we've obviously been covering here on Sky. And he said, on day 43, this close to the end of the swim, I can honestly say that I am the most physically and mentally exhausted that I've ever been from such prolonged lack of sleep, injury, consecutive days of hard swimming and campaigning. He expected it, mentally at least, to get easier and found that it had not. I know Dungeness and getting over that last ninth headland was very difficult for him, but this has been, make no bones about it, a real slog, hasn't it? Yes, it has. I and mean, he called this the Everest of swimming uh, when he started off uh, in, in Land's End. And he did that because it is a huge challenge. Uh, if, you, if you take the, the mountaineering uh, analogy further, um, Dungeness Peninsula was that final ice wall before the summit that he needed to overcome. Now he's so close to the summit, it's much easier. And he will plant his flag and set a record today, uh, put his name down in history as the first person to go from Land's End all the way to, to Dover. Um, and, and it is a, a phenomenal achievement. Um, speaking to other channel swimmers, they are full of admiration because they know how tough it is to be out here, how lonely it is. Uh, and he does have a support boat and they have been a huge motivator for him. But nevertheless, when he's in the water, staring down into the gloom, it's disorientating. Um, you, you lose all sense of, um, uh, of, of sight, sound. It's sensed through deprivation. Uh, and it is a, a mental challenge then to keep going when your body is hurting and somewhere you need to find that inner strength to keep going and make it to the finishing line. And that is what he has done. And we're standing right by it, ready to welcome him. Thomas, we'll let you chase him down. He's going faster than you are right now. Thomas Moore, thanks very much indeed. Uh, so let's return then to um, my guests here, Hayden Welch and Greg White. So we were going to talk with you about the fact that you didn't quite make what Lewis is about to achieve. How far did you get to? When did you try? What was the experience like for well, you? Well, I started from here. So my destination was, in fact, um, the other end of the English Channel. Um, I spent 100 hours swimming and got as far as Portland um, before my, uh, my swim ended. And then we had a week of gales and the continuity was spoiled. I ran out of time and, um, and just decided the experiment was over. And what was it actually like for you in the water, the 100 oh. hours of swimming? <laughs> it was fantastic, I have to say. You know, the English Channel can be the most beautiful place. When, uh, when you swim through the day and the sun starts setting, uh, it, it sends a glitter path of sparkles all across the water. It makes you feel you could swim along that path till morning. Um, but it can also be brutal. You know, it's quite fitting today that we have this weather for, for Lewis to finish in, because this is the weather we, uh, we get used to. We train in it, uh, we enjoy it. It's tough, it's hard, um, but the, the beauty of long distance swimming is, is wonderful. 
I have to say the sea state is fine for him today compared with what no doubt you experienced and what he experienced. Yeah. He, of course, did it the other way around. What you did was go straight into the busiest shipping lane in the world by tonnage and have all the murky water. He started in Cornwall, albeit with lots of jellyfish, marine life, sometimes dolphin pods swimming alongside him to keep him going. But he had blue water that he could see in. Indeed. And this is part of the point he's making. This is the urban water we've got here, and this is the colour it ends up. That's part of the message he's trying to bring back. It's this colour, this, this dark, greeny, browny, muddy colour from here all the way to Portland. Uh, it was for me. I saw my hands in front of my in front of my face. I very rarely saw anything else. Greg White, um, it's your job to get people in the the right mentality to do this sort of thing. First of all, how impressed are you by what Lewis has achieved? I'm peering out into the distance, seeing if yeah, I can see well, his boat, he's actually. Right? And <laughs> he I can see a fish boat. It's quite hard to see anything in this murk. <laughs> um, so, so what do you think of what he's done? I mean, it's incredible. I mean, it is a war of attrition. And, and it's interesting what you were just talking about there. What you have to remember is that, that, that Lewis started in glorious sunshine, in wonderful weather. And as time has gone on, it's got worse and worse and worse. And of course, what that has done is that's tracked his physical state and his mental state. So he's got more fatigued as the weather's got worse, psychologically he's started to question himself as the weather's got worse. So it has got much more difficult for him as time has gone on. So to get this far is incredible. And, and there's no doubt about it, given his tenacity and what he's achieved so far, he will finish today. So how important is goal setting? And in fact, he has two. One is to finish, and the fishing, finishing line is just there. Secondly, it is to get his message across yeah. about getting governments to get inspired to protect the, the oceans and, and, and have marine protected areas. How big an impact does that have mentally on making his body and his mind do stuff which it really doesn't want to do? Yeah. Well, you know, it's absolutely crucial. I mean, it, firstly, the goal setting is absolutely key. And, and of course, Lewis's goal was to finish here on Shakespeare Beach. But actually, it's the daily goals, it's the short term goals that have really mattered. What you have to consider is that, that we consider 10 kilometres of swimming a marathon. So really what you're thinking about, he's doing a marathon every single day, but he's doing it on a very small muscle mass, just the arms. So that's why he's picked up the injuries and the attrition that he's had with that. And then of course, the key thing is motivation, keeping yourself going. And actually that message about marine conservation, about our oceans, which are seriously under threat, is one of the key things which is driving him on. So rather than it being a, a, a hindrance to him, actually that is probably going to be the central motivator which keeps him going. Yeah, and we've seen the scallop wars, haven't we? Fighting a force left of our fishermen taking a few of them, but then the gales disrupted it. In your mind at the moment, apart from the out of time, it's just hard to actually get back into that zone. The after the fish finished, I need to get back in the water. I felt that I did not want that. Uh, it was no longer a feeling where you wake up in the morning and thinking, oh, I've really got in that water again. There's a feeling of dread. The feeling is passed after a couple of weeks, and I really need to get back. You know, 25 years ago, I still want to do it. I really, really that Lewis has done it. We can swim pools in spirits and goggles. It's wonderful to see it happen. And his is fantastic. You know, when I did it, I had no cause. I just wanted to go for a long swim, and I still do. <laughs> oh, I think I've, I see you getting a bit emotional, actually, because I was going to ask you, is there a little part of you that wishes it was going to be you stepping out on this beach? I'm, in the very, I'm hours, thrilled though. to see that it is Lewis. Uh, I've got some other swims in mind. Um, the problem I have is that they're my dreams. I can't dare let them become my wife's nightmares. <laughs> and, and seriously, though, That's I'm true. 60 years old. I've got a few more swims left in, to, in me to yeah. do, and I uh, can't wait to get started again. And just very quickly, Greg, um, have we all got that in us, do you think? Yes, is the answer to that. I think it's about application, really, and I think it's actually about drive. I think what's great here is that Lewis has got a cause, and that cause is a really important cause for all of us. And I think if you have that cause and you have that drive and determination, everybody can achieve something really special. I'm just telling you I haven't got it in me today. You have, you have. <laughs> uh, he's asking if I had my swimming costume with me earlier. The answer is no. Uh, Greg White, Hayden Welsh, lovely to have you here. Thank you very much indeed. It's a truly inspirational story for all of us, isn't it? It is. Certainly. And uh, we'll see if we have all got something like that in us. Plenty more still to come, following Lewis's progress as he heads towards the finish line, just behind me, back in just a moment.
Well, welcome back to a cold, windy and wet Dover where we're here to witness the end of Lewis Pugh's long swim. Mother Nature's been trying to stop him, leaving him at the mercy of tides and jellyfish, lots of them, but his mission to do right by it and help to protect our oceans is nearly complete against all the odds. Well, I am here at the finish line, Shakespeare Beach in Dover, and as you can see, he'll have a fight in his hands with the weather, as I mentioned, but I'll be meeting him when he emerges from the waves for the final time. Expecting him to get into the water, uh, or he's in the water rather, he's in the water, been in about, about five minutes now, and will follow every stroke of his last swim as he attempts to become the first person to swim the 330 miles from Land's End to Dover, wearing just speedos, goggles, and a hat. Those are the rules. Well, he has got 2.5 miles to go, four kilometers, and it's all in the name of saving our oceans. He wants government to protect at least 30% of them by 2030 from industrial fishing, mining, and drilling. And the Environment Secretary, Michael Gove, has told Sky News that Lewis has shown inspirational leadership and grit. Well, joining me now is the former competitive swimmer, Mark Foster, but first, let's look back. Back to shore after his penultimate swim, and Lewis Pugh has much to celebrate. Made it. Just three more kilometres to go. He's swum 327 miles from Land's End, and Dover's now within reach, the first person to swim the length of the English Channel. He's taken half a million strokes, burnt 98,000 calories, and been stung by countless jellyfish. It's been an incredibly tough few days, incredibly tough few days. I've, I'm mentally exhausted, I'm physically exhausted, I'm emotionally exhausted. The team is exhausted. We are all exhausted, but also excited, also excited. Dungeon has started becoming a bigger, bigger hurdle. Every time you think to yourself, well, is this going to be the final head, headland which is going to stop me? And you know, we, we threw out the charts and we worked out all the different options. Was I going to go inshore, but then we're close to a power station? Was I going to go further outshore, but then we've got the, all the shipping coming up and down the English Channel? We, we didn't discount any option, even the option of swimming across the English Channel and swimming to France. Lewis has been swimming for a cause, better marine protection. We went to Goodwin Sands, just off the Kent coast, a few days every month is exposed by the spring tide and it's a conservation zone because of its rare marine life. Yet Dover Harbour has been given the go-ahead to dredge three million tonnes of sand for its construction work. All the creatures are, are, are in the sand and if you start taking the top two metres off the sand here, it's going to have a huge ecological impact on the whole area. I know we can't see it and out of sight is out of mind, but they are there. The port says the sands are the most economic source of material for its expansion and has been given the go-ahead to start dredging by the independent marine regulator. But Lewis wants the government to put the environment first. The swim has all been about trying to deliver a message to the public about what's happening to our oceans. Relief, excitement, but that's really the important thing at the important moment because th this this long swim was not about swimming. It was not about trying to become the first person to swim the full length of the English Channel. It was about trying to deliver a message. One last push and Lewis will be in Dover. After 105 hours of water, he's looking forward to a long sleep. Thomas Moore, Sky News, Dover. Well, our science correspondent, Thomas Moore, is the man with the best view of all. He is following Lewis Pugh's every stroke in a support vessel. And uh, how far has he got, do you think? He's, he's got this really rhythmic, steady swimming style, hasn't he, Thomas? He has, yeah. He's probably done about half a mile uh, so far. Um, now, just look at him go. I mean, it's just uh, very steady progress that he's making alongside the support boat, the Aguila there. Um, and imagine the, what he's having to do here. Uh, this is a man with tendonitis uh, in his, his left shoulder. It really hurts every time he lifts his arm. Um, and uh, 
that sends spasms all the way down his back, um, and yet he's having to keep going. This is real grit now that is going to see him uh, over the, the finishing line. Um, he's taken something like 530,000 strokes uh, on his journey up from Land's End, burning 98,000 calories. Uh, and uh, the, he's got on board a physiotherapist uh, and uh, a, a, a nutritionist, a chef, who's trying to keep his body in best possible condition. Because every time he gets out after one of these long swims, his muscles are screaming out, they are breaking down. And uh, normally an, uh, an endurance athlete would then have time to recover before going again, but uh, Lewis hasn't. He's had to get back in that water, do it all over. So there's an awful lot of uh, breakdown chemicals, inflammatory responses going on inside his body right now, uh, and yet he's still having to keep going. It hurts, but he's still going. Well, let me also bring in, while uh, Thomas is following Lewis Pugh, former competitive swimmer Mark Foster, you have to hand it to him. What do, you, what do you notice about his stroke there? He's doing it, obviously, to sustain for this endurance sport, but it's slow and steady wins the race in this case. Yeah, it? well, it's just finding a, finding a rhythm, really. Um, it's, you know, you're talking, it was just, you've said, 10 kilometres a day, every day. Um, he's, he's not going to go off with a massive leg kick. Um, and basically, it's just going to be, it's, it's, it's all arms and a slow tempo because um, he's got to do hour after hour after hour. And I just suppose it's finding the rhythm. I don't know when he's feeding or when he's eating. I haven't seen anything, but, um, yeah, it's sort of one of those things you think, wonder what's going through his, through his mind. He's got an awful lot of time to think out there. Trying to hear what he's, what he's shouting out. Thomas Moore will no doubt report back in just a moment, but he does like to shout out thoughts sometimes <laughs> and uh, get his team get, to what, write them down. Yeah, well, I guess he, he wants to share what's going on, 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 on his, in, in his mind, because this is, yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge, it's a massive challenge, but at the same time, he's doing it for a, for a cause. So, I mean, that's the whole thing. He's really he's doing it for some purpose. It's not been a... It's a, it's a personal challenge, but he's doing it for, for the greater good, which is about the environment. And we talked earlier about these uh, steely seas we've got here, navy grey, you might call them, um, very murky water to swim in. You don't yes. know what's around you. You don't know what's underneath you. Yeah, and I'm, I'm <laughs> sure he's got used to it in his head, but for someone like you who's spent your lifetime going up and down a swimming pool, it's a completely different sense. It's a completely isn't it? different environment. I mean, he's spent his, 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 his swimming, his endurance swimming life in, in, in the open water. So I guess he's, he's very at home out there. And I think it's like anybody, when you do anything for the first time, it's quite daunting. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you, you become. I think um, it, it's, it's, it looks very um, uh, solitary out there. But I guess people have been in from, from time to time. Uh, I can only see the pictures that you can see. And it looks like he's going quite fast. Um, but believe me, he's not. It's a long, slow plod, as you say. It's not about how fast you get there, it's about getting there in the end. So, um, yeah, he won't be seeing the bottom, he won't be feeling anything. I think things will be hitting him every now and again, maybe, yeah. as we, you said before, jellyfish or fish. But... Well, less so in this part of the waters compared with uh, down in the southwest. Certainly, there it was a real problem. A struggle to get breathing right in rough seas. He's talked about having just a nanosecond to decide when to breathe or else getting a mouthful of water, starting to choke, and actually, actually got on board his support vessel and started to vomit on one occasion. Yeah. Thomas Moore, you heard him, he was perhaps shouting out to you, um, but uh, his mood is yes. certainly single-minded and saying that the work starts now in some respects. Did you hear what he said to, had to say? No, uh, we weren't on the boat at the time, but he has been delivering a message to Michael Grove, and that is all about protection of the seas, that what the government has done so far is not good enough, according to, to Lewis, that he wants much tighter control uh, than the, the UK government has yet been prepared to give to the vast majority of UK's coastal waters. Uh, just uh, two square miles of ocean uh, have a total ban on fishing, drilling, uh, mineral evacuation. Lewis is really pushing for much tighter controls, and that, that is why he is pushing himself to these limits. Uh, nobody would do that voluntarily. Uh, 16 times uh, the length of uh, crossing the channel, that's the distance he has gone. Um, and uh, what has kept him going along the way uh, is, is that thought that he can actually make a difference here uh, and really try and bring in proper marine protection yep. around the world, but here in the UK, in the English Channel too. Headlands, uh, Thomas, has been so very difficult because obviously Dungeness, I know you swam with him this weekend, 
what was that like for you? Because the, that, that one of the headlands of Dungeness was yet another headland that was difficult to get round. Why is that? It's because of the way the, the currents work in, in the English Channel, uh, that as the tides move over um, shallow and, and then deeper water, they can do some really strange things. So sometimes the, the tides just disappear altogether. He calls it a lazy sea. Uh, and that's what happened around the Dungeness Peninsula. Uh, and he found it really tough going because as you can see there, he, he always swims on this side of his support boat. He breathes to his right. He can always see the reassurance of the boat uh, and Stephen the skipper there. And they talk to each other on a regular basis. So he, he was swimming, uh, uh, unable to see the land, and occasionally he was taking a breath to his left, and that's when he would see uh, the nuclear power station on the Dungeness Peninsula, and it just didn't seem to move. And that was disheartening, when he didn't seem to make any progress whatsoever, uh, and, and that's why he found it really tough mentally to keep picking himself up, to go back and do it again the next day, knowing that it was going to be just as tough uh, and yet somehow he had to make it round this headland if he was going to get the, uh, make it through to Dover. Yes, and he's talked, hasn't he, about the wrong sea state, the wrong current, the wrong swell, actually feels like he's swimming uphill, which must just be so soul-destroying. What about your swim? How far yeah. did you manage and uh, what did it feel like? <laughs> And I did a kilometre with him, so he's done 530, but it did give me some inkling of what he has been up against. The seas were quite large then, the, the skipper called it lumpy, uh, and when I turned my head to breathe, I wasn't sure whether I'd be uh, faced with uh, a, a wave, uh, so I'd be swallowing water rather than gulping air. Uh, and that was, uh, that was really hard to keep going in those circumstances, because once you start swallowing large amounts of, of salt water, not only are you choking, but you also start to feel sick, quite frankly, uh, and, and then it really does sap your energy very hard to keep going in those conditions. And if you look at the, the waters now, and the waves are nothing like uh, um, the, what I faced when I was swimming with him, but nevertheless, they're coming straight onto him. So he's having to push his way through the waves the whole time, uh, and that will, will certainly be slowing him down a little. It's hard work, isn't it, even now? Thomas Moore, thank you very much indeed. Well, obviously, uh, campaigning is absolutely key to what Lewis Pugh is about. Not far from here, a campaign a battle is underway right now. Ten miles of sandbank, known as you might notice from my guests here, Goodwin Sand. So let's bring in Joanna Thompson and Fiona Punter. Thanks for joining us. Um, tell me about Goodwin Sands then. First of all, why is it so important to protect to protect it? What direction is it in? Is it it's it's that way? Yeah. Right, OK. Yeah. So, and why, why do you want to protect this sandbank? Well, for, for uh, numerous reasons. I mean, it's historically, it's really, really um, significant. At least over 2,000 shipwrecks have been uh, recorded there over the past 800 years. There's military air crash sites there. There's a seal colony. There's the newly, hopefully, designated marine conservation zone. Um, and it's a natural sea defence for our East Kent foreshore, which is really vulnerable to coastal flooding. So these marine protection zones, part of Michael Gove's plan and the government's yes. plan, yes. started in 2013. Yes. He announced some more, didn't he, yes. uh, back yes. on World Oceans Day, yes. under consultation right now. Is yours actually fully fledged as a, as a conservation zone, or is it one of those that's in, 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 a, in phased...? It's the third. It's coming it's out the in the third phase. tranche. OK. Yes. Yes. Now, the problem you've got is that right behind us, or right here, is the port of Dover, and they want to get some of the sand and gravel from Goodwin Sands to expand the port, and that's your battle. Three million tonnes of aggregate they want to take from the Goodwins. They're going to scalp the sands. And by scalping it, they'll be taking the wildlife, the microflora, the microfauna, the bottom of the food chain. They'll also be potentially dredging air crash sites and all the historic archaeology that is based in the sands. So, for example, blue mussel beds, they knit the seabed together, they provide habitat for other species. Very easy to destroy things like that very quickly. Yeah, they're very fragile. Ross, uh, not very pretty, but there's a species called Ross worms. They create reefs and they're essential to the foundation of the sands. If they dredge, it'll go down to rock bottom. They'll be nothing. And they take a long time to recover. They take a long, very long time to recover. So the David Port Authority, the Harbour Authority is here saying that it's very nearby, it's got a low carbon footprint to get this stuff, 
It's already been approved by the licensing authorities and actually it's a very eco-efficient way of getting aggregates that they need to carry out the work. Well, this is, this is what the whole argument against Blue Belt versus um, Blue Growth. You know, you've got to win, you've got to consider both of them. And Michael Gove's plan is absolutely useless or worthless if a week after the consultation period is finished, a dredging, um, a marine dr uh, aggregate licence dredging is, um, is granted for the very sand, which is one of the protected features. It just makes a complete nonsense, a mockery of the whole system. The carbon footprint argument is also very, very weak because by growing the port, they will be increasing their own carbon footprint. So you can't really say that one thing is acceptable and one isn't. But we're in a situation where we've got Brexit coming up, less than a year to go. You've got to get trade into Britain. You need a port that's functioning. It's very old. No doubt it needs rebuilding in places and improving and expanding. You have to allow economies like this to thrive in these places. Well, they do, but if you look at the map, the actual area landfill which is created just an empty space that actually no development plans or whatever uh, whichever it is at the public meeting they said what are you going to do with this land and said well actually we take it over and it all depends on the location for example put forward four or five years ago for a Brexit referendum so then you knew what that was going to be used for that that's going to be the result well, Michael Gove and his blue belt, he'll be coming down here. Yes, He's already been on board. Yeah. You've got a list we, of questions, No, we've you? got a letter we want to give him. OK, right. So not to take up too, too much of his time. Yes. So the idea of the blue belt, there's 50 of these marine conservation zones. They started in 2013. Another 41 going out for consultation. The consultation period has just finished. Yeah. That's the point he's raising to be the detention. He's been chatting to get on. Yeah, I've, and we're going to try and get a word with him. I'm going to try and interrupt with him. Uh, he makes his way to all over. Uh, it's a really nice thing. He's going to come over. I really appreciate what, what he's doing. Um, and he's going into the way he's going to a sort of name down a little. Uh, if I can get the boat a little bit closer to Lewis to make it easier for him, and we'll try and get a, uh, a question to him to find out uh, how the swim's going. Um, Lewis? 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 It's difficult to get him to hear, hear us because of sensory deprivation when he's in the water. Lewis? Okay, skipper, there you can see, because he's turned towards the skipper, and this is exactly how I was saying earlier on, uh, how uh, the skipper and Lewis talk to each other on a regular basis. And he's coming over to us now. He's going to interrupt his long swim to have a little chat with Sky News as he's coming along. So if we just slow down the boat and make it easy for Lewis, because he can't keep going otherwise. Lewis, how's it going? Ah, oh, Thomas! <laughs> Can you come to the other side of the boat, Thomas? Yeah, the side of the boat. Uh, this is uh, just going to move our camera location this side. Just take care there, Lewis, around the props. There we go. Lewis, how's it going? Oh, it's a bit tough this last little bit, but I've only got, I think, another two kilometres now. And I'm so excited to finally get there to finish this swim. What does it mean to see the white cliffs like that? <laughs> I've been dreaming of this day for nearly 50 days to finally see the white cliffs of Dover. And over there is the end. I mean, can you believe it? I mean, it's just uh, absolutely astonishing what you've achieved now to be this close. Thomas, when I started, I wasn't sure I could make it. I really wasn't sure. And it's, it's a dream. You know, channel swimming is not a solo sport. There's been a whole, my whole team there who've helped me. There's a lot of chances. Thank you so much. And there he goes, once again, swimming on his way to Dover now. Uh, he's done 328 miles by my reckoning, uh, almost there in Dover, uh, as he heads out along the White Cliffs. And as you heard, conditions aren't the best this morning, uh, but you heard his spirit is high, and that's what will get him through to the finishing line. Just as the wind is picking up, blowing offshore, he's going to have to contend with that if he's going to be able to walk up Shakespeare Beach. 
Thomas, I'm really excited to say that we can see you at the finishing line. So finally, we can see the catamaran support vessel and the boat that you're on as well. So finally for us here on Shakespeare Beach in Dover, Lewis Pugh, you are in sight. I'm going to tell you that, which is brilliant for him, isn't it? That we on the beach now can begin to see him and, and effectively bring him in. Yeah, and, and also for him, he sort of gets to see the, the, the finishing line. So that must mean mentally that's one of these things that's kind of like, oh, I'm nearly there. And I know when he got in this morning, he was about four or five K away, which doesn't seem an awful long way when you've been going for 550 kilometers. But it must be, I was always thinking about that. At the beginning, it must have been this buzz, the start of the journey and the middle part must have been the gruelling hard part the physical and the mental side of things and now it's as much as he's hurt and it'll be like i'm nearly there and this is all over and then he can then actually tell everybody why he's done it yeah absolutely i know absolutely well let's bring in another of my guests now from the blue marine foundation come around claire and uh, and join me and mark um claire brooke here so why is something like this that lewis is doing so important to raise awareness for things that you are campaigning for. Well, it's just fantastic that he's doing this ambitious swim and, and drawing everyone's attention to the crisis in our ocean, because he's been talking about the fact that on the way, he's hardly swum past any fish at all. We're basically emptying our oceans of fish, and that's you know terrible for their ability, not only to provide us with food, but also their function in as regulating the climate. They're obviously doing it quite well today. But. Regulating the jellyfish blooms, one of the reasons we have so many. You know, that is, that is an indicator species, isn't it? Tell me why. Exactly. Well, larger fish have uh, jellyfish as their main diet. So, for example, um, a bluefin tuna will eat on average uh, 31 pounds of jellyfish a day. So if we take all the big fish out of the sea, then these other uh, parts of the ecosystem will start to thrive and they're not always desirable. There was one moment when, uh, nearly midway through, he realised he had to do another night dive. And um, he had these neon bits attached to him, didn't he? Like, as if it was a party as he dived in, so that the support team could see him. They put the torches on the water to, so he could see where he dived in. Filled with jellyfish, absolutely filled with jellyfish. Terrifying. And they yeah. had this debate about how many times he could be stung to make it acceptable for him to continue. He got in, he managed eight minutes in there and had to be pulled out, absolutely yeah. stung to pieces. No, the mind boggles. It's, it's incredible what he's put himself through and we're, we're kind of in awe of that. And, you know, all of us, like the Blue Marine Foundation and all the other environmental NGOs, are so grateful to him for having put himself through this. Well, the man who makes the decisions, the Environment Secretary Michael Gove, has been uh, with him as well, saying that he is an inspiration, that he's throwing real grid. What does Michael Gove need to do to get the protection that we see on land also in the seas, because we're so far behind, aren't we? Well, we have a, a very ambitious... The government has a very ambitious policy on marine protection. The UK has the fifth largest ocean estate in the world. We have 6.8 square kilometres around the world, around these you know, tiny little overseas territories, that is in our gift to protect. And we have this blue belt policy. And amazingly, in these you know, very divided political times, it's actually something that is uniting a lot of MPs. We have 283 MPs have signed up to the blue belt charter saying they want that. And that's from across all political parties. So there's a lot of will from the people, obviously, from, uh, from uh, all politicians. And so all we have to do, it's a bit like Lewis right now, we just have to push it over the edge. You know, the policy's there, it's ambitious, it's visionary, it just needs to be a bit better implemented. And at the moment, we're not really doing that right, and we're not doing it in such a way either that these uh, marine protected areas are, are effective, or that they're bringing benefits to the overseas territories themselves. So the criticism has been for the UK ones anyway, that you're, you're protecting a specific species from a specific activity. It's not a root, root and branch ecosystem habitat protection. And actually, so for example, we've talked about the dredging here nearby at Goodwin Sands. Um, the, the protection areas don't really do their job. Is, is that a fair criticism, do you think? Exactly right. You have to consider a whole ecosystem. You, know, you can't just protect one single species. And these marine ecosystems are fantastically complex, you know, and they interrely. And so you, you have to think about nature leading the way in these marine conservation zones, not just, you know, one particular interest group. Um, you know, and we've got these crazy situations where you, you've got marine conservation zones, supposedly, 
which are allowing the Dutch electric pulse fishing fleet in there, basically electrocuting the entire seabed. You know, that's not protection, that's meaningless. And Lewis Pugh has talked, hasn't he, as, remember, UN patron of the oceans, about industrial fishing literally trawling the bottom out of the seas. Let's listen again about why this is so important to him. I'm so, I'm so excited, excited and relieved. It's been an enormously long swim. As you say, we've been on here for 49 days. We've been at sea for 49 days. You know, I also wasn't sure when I, when I started at Land's End whether I would be able to make it. You know, the world is divided between pioneers and followers. Uh, pioneers do not know whether they're going to be successful in, in their quest. Uh, I hoped, I prayed that I could do it. I did the training to do it. But still, it's an awful long way. And anything could have happened over those 50 days. Well, Lewis Pugh is in the distance here, uh, coming in to view in Shakespeare Beach. I don't know if we can show you a, a, a small picture of him in the distance. You have to peer and maybe get your glasses on to spot him, but we can see him. It's all good. Uh, not long to go now, Lewis, is our message. So, yes, OK. Well, anyway, peer at that briefly while I talk to Mark. <laughs> um, so the last, uh, the last stages for him, 49 days in... Uh, so many calories consumed it doesn't bear thinking about. So much difficulty th that he's faced, not least carrying these injuries. Neck, overcompensated back. You, you've probably been there yourself with some of those injuries. Uh, yes, um, but he has a very, very short period of time to put them right again before he gets back in. If I've had an injury in the past, you're, you're managed on land in a physio room and some of the time you don't get back in the next day because it's, it's not good for your, your body, so you get time to heal where... He every day has had to get back in again and get on with it because he can't get behind his schedule and also he's set out 50 days so he had to be here at 1.30 today to finish it. So he's had a, a, a goal and an end in sight and he's had to stick to it. Can I just say to the viewers at home, I'm sort of standing, I'm, I'm a lot taller than I would be normally. Yeah. But I'm now just making myself look short. It is short. what it is, you know. Sorry, Anna, I'm just... Physiologically, to... <laughs> swimmers are tall, Mark told me. <laughs> That's true. It's all stood, it's all stood levers. Obviously, the, right. the taller you are, the further you can go on one single stroke. But um, no, what he's done is is, is quite incredible. Um, I can't even imagine, you know, getting in there for for one of the days, let alone 50 days non-stop. But the bottom line, it's 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 for a bigger cause. And we heard from uh, Blue Marine Foundation. Then, uh, when you hear these stories and hear what's going on in the oceans, which we don't see because it's beneath the surface. It's fascinating what we are doing to a planet. And that's the irony, isn't it? That actually it wasn't until we invented scuba diving in the late 20th century that we realised the destruction that the Industrial Revolution and current practices were wreaking on the ocean. So it's, it's, a, it's a new thing, which is why we're so late to the past, in, a, in effect, to protect the marine environment. So Lewis is excited about finishing. Let's hear once again to him talking to Thomas Moore just a few minutes ago. Right, it's a bit tough to start a little bit, but I've only got, I think, another two kilometres now. And I'm so excited to finally get there to finish this swim. I've been dreaming this day for nearly 50 days to finally see the White Cliffs of Dover. And over there is the end. Thomas, when I started, I wasn't sure I could make it. I really wasn't sure. And it's, it's a dream. You know, Channel 3 has been a Oh, my whole team there who've helped me get here and I'm so excited to just walk up that beach now. We're just going to punch through it and try and get right in close to the White Cliffs. Yes, the White Cliffs are firmly in view, thanking his team there. They've all been cooped up on a support vessel, a catamaran, close quarters, not easy, it has to be said. Logistics, extremely complicated. Their decision, in fact, to go the south side of the Isle of Wight, because of marine traffic, really, mm -hmm. uh, meant that they struggled to get into marinas to pick up water. They were living off emergency supplies. So you forget, this is an expedition, really. Yeah. And there's so many things to think about. Well, it's nice to see him there sort of acknowledging, and it's all about the support staff. So, yes, he's doing what he's doing, and he's his, his bit is I get in the water, I do my swim, and then I get to be a spokesman around the environment, whereas the team of people that, I don't know, the boat, nutritionist, physio, he's got these other people that enable him to do what he set out to do. So it's nice. It's a nice little thing there. Yes, indeed so. Um, in terms of the training that he's done, you know, you perhaps started in Billericay in Essex, maybe. Was... He, he was born in Plymouth. <laughs> yeah. 
and uh, ended up living in Cape Town uh, from a young age. But he's been training around the Falkland Islands and the Cape of Good Hope. This is, these are extraordinary places to, to, to train for something like this. Yeah, and, and I, I guess that's the thing, though. When he knew what he was going to be up against, and obviously, clearly, they knew what was ahead of him, and they researched very, very thoroughly. So if you're going to put yourself in those conditions, then you need to prepare in those conditions. It's a little bit like, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm a speed swimmer, so therefore I need to teach my body to go fast. He's an endurance swimmer, so he needs to get in there day in and day out and make sure his body can deal with what he's going to ask it to do, uh, but also in those sort of conditions, because otherwise if he's going to be swimming up and down a pool and then put himself in there, it's going to be a huge, huge shock. So it's sort of go into some bad conditions in bad weather, whether it rains, not going to make an awful lot of difference when you're in the water, but the wind and the waves and the swell, it's the actually, rain is actually slowing down. It's, it's, calm, it's been thunderous it's and brighter. pretty grim, but it's actually getting brighter, isn't well, it? Which is brilliant. Interesting, you said earlier about the breathing, you see. So yes. he'll look in there, he'll get in there and go, where's the swell coming from? If it's coming from this side, well, do you know what? I better breathe to the other side, otherwise I'm going to take on an awful lot of water and not be able to breathe. So you look at the conditions, you look at the environment, and he'll change accordingly. And he's talked actually about his tongue um, swelling, actually, because of the salt water mm. and the amount that he had consumed. Mm. So very difficult conditions. Um, so once again, I say he is in shot uh, on the beach. Um, our camera doesn't show it as closely as the eye can see, I have to say. So to me, he doesn't look very far away at all. But from our camera, he is a dot in the distance. So bear with us if you don't mind looking at, uh, at our pictures of him in the distance. But certainly, there are some people there to see him. The crowds are building. No doubt some had been pulled up. And in fact, some people have gone into the water, which is very supportive. The tide is coming in. They've timed this, haven't they, to try and get the, the use of the spring tides, which certainly pummel him along. Yes. Sometimes he described taking one stroke and the current taking him another stroke. And that's what they've been seek seeking. The spring tides have been a real help for him. Yeah. There we are. Look at that support. <laughs> I guess you don't want to go against nature, do you? Because nature will win. So let's try and use it where possible. So looking at the tides every day, high tide, low tide, and trying to swim at the best opportunity rather than... <laughs> I had a conversation with a friend of mine. Actually, Greg White, you said, before he was on, he was on earlier, and he said he swam the channel once and got a mile away from France. The tide turned. He sat there for six hours going nowhere, and they pulled him out. He was only a mile offshore. So, yes, they're trying to use the environment to help him, which actually he's talking about the environment. This is all about the environment. Um, and those, I'm guessing those guys there might swim back a little bit and give them a little bit of support. So. Yes, 30% of people trying to swim the channel actually fail within one mile, so yeah. that's why. Um, the importance of channel swimming rules, which is the Speedo style shorts, we the goggles and the uh, hat, yes. that is it. The jellyfish land of Cornwall and Devon. You certainly wanted a bit of protection, didn't you? Mm. Why have we got those rules? It's bonkers, isn't it? Um, you'd have to talk to someone from the Cross Swimming Channel Swimming yeah. Association. I kind of, I, I get, it makes it a level playing field. And what they're trying to do is make people swim it in certain conditions, which are the hardest conditions, I've got to say. A lot more people would make it in body suits or in wetsuits, I should say, because A, they keep you warm. And probably the most important thing, they keep you buoyant. You're not, you're not going to sink in them because they're actually, they, they actually help you float better. So they try and make the conditions very, very hard. And then I, I'm sure he would love to have been in a wetsuit every day. But I think the thing is, he's conditioned his body now. And you saw there when he was just sitting, treading water and chatting to your reporter, Thomas, yeah, Thomas Moore. Yeah. Um, the, he seems, he clearly he's quite home in the water, but he didn't seem cold. We're standing here going, God, it's cold. No. This isn't cold. I mean, it's quite brutal what he's doing. So, but he seems to be enjoying himself. Yeah, he has, of course, um, swum in polar regions. The 12 degrees that he had round Lizard Point, and I have to confess, I stood in a river at a consistent 12 degrees this summer in Gloucestershire, and I screamed to get out of the water. 12 degrees is not something <laughs> I can cope with. Very 12 degrees around Lizard Point, 14 not far from here. Mm -hmm. A little bit warmer, um, eight up to 18 degrees. So those are the sorts of temperatures. A little bit warmer than anticipated because of the warm summer that we've had. Know that when they get in a swimming pool and they're swimming in a public pool, it will be 28 degrees, 29 degrees. So it, it, it's cold. Look at that. Beautiful. The cliffs of Dover, Lewis Pugh arriving. Thomas Moore. Yes, Anna, he's, uh, he's moved in shore. He's hugging the cliffs there, as you can see. The wind has really picked up uh, and it's blowing offshore. 
So he should get some shelter there, both from the, the waves and the wind there, trying to make conditions uh, slightly easier for himself as he swims this, this last stretch towards Dover. Uh, it's not far to go now. Uh, this has been an epic swim, 49 days uh, he's been swimming. Uh, for two hours and a bit sometimes. Sometimes he's been swimming at night, three o'clock in the morning when his body is screaming out for sleep to recover from his toil of the previous day. He's having to once again get back in the water. He's now buoyant. Um, speaking to him this morning, uh, he is so looking forward to letting his body rest, to sleep because of the efforts uh, of the past few weeks. Um, and you can still see him making steady progress, uh, very repetitive arm stroke, very steady arm stroke, uh, lifting his arms well clear of the water, uh, because that is what uh, a lot of open uh, water swimmers would do, trying to make sure they get their elbows nice and high, clear of the waves uh, and reaching forwards. And again, pulling himself uh, inch by inch towards Shakespeare Beach in Dover now. Thomas Moore, thank you very much indeed. Well, with me now, I have Antoinette Pugh, Lewis Pugh's, I was about to say long-suffering wife, but I don't know if that's how you feel about it. Um, I know you've been on board with him. Yes. First of all, you must be extremely proud of your husband. I am very, very proud, and also of his team. Everybody's worked really, really hard um, to support him, um, the public, his team, friends, even just me being here. Um, I've had to rely on my, my son and friends to keep the whole home front going. Um, so, yeah, it's been a, a team effort and I'm just really happy for Lewis that it's coming to an end. Did he really believe that this was possible? Because he talks, doesn't he, about how the world is divided into pioneers and followers. As a pioneer, you have so many sleepless nights because you don't know that something is achievable. He is obviously a pioneer. Did he, did he really believe he could do this? Yes, and I, I'm glad that you bring up the fact that he is a pioneer because that is exactly what he does um, and, and who he is. And before expeditions, there are always ups and downs and, and things change. So every day there's a new challenge and um, so sometimes I'm sure there's a bit of doubt that comes in, but I've never had any doubt in him. We see the, the point where this starts, don't we? In mid-July, those balmy days of the, the heat wave here in Britain. Yes. But for Lewis and the team, and for you at home, this starts months, if not years, before, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, he, he started a good 10 years ago. Um, and finally, you know, he's, he's getting the recognition that he deserves. And... Uh, yeah, even for the for the for the planning of this expedition, it sort of all started last year already. It's probably been two years, and he's got a lot of ideas that he mulls around in in his brain, and he thinks about it non-stop, and then he comes out with with different um, aspects of what he wants to do to to get the attention um, that he needs to, to speak about the oceans and protecting our oceans. He's taking a little rest, isn't he? Treading water every now and then. And there's people in the water out to support him. Yes. <laughs> yes. Feeling the pain, I was going to say, but it's probably warmer in the water than outside on a day like this, isn't it? Has he had a lot of support as, as, as he's uh, uh, gone through the 49 days? Yes, absolutely. And I think that's really been spurring him on. And it's been wonderful. And even, even at home um, in Cape Town, uh, where we live, I've even had people knocking on the door and saying, how's Lewis doing? And send him our love. And so he really has had a lot of support. Well, he obviously tweeted last night that he thanked you specifically for the sacrifice that you and your family have made. I know he's looking forward to going back to his dogs at home yes. as well, isn't he? <laughs> uh, four dogs at home back in Cape Town, yes. no doubt. And a lot of rest due. What do you think he will... How will he feel at the end of this? Because it's quite hard finishing a project sometimes, isn't it? Definitely. And I think, I think he'll feel emotionally and physically shattered. And he'll probably have to take it easy, but still do a little bit of training in between to slow down um, after this, because you can't just stop everything. Um, and he'll have to rest those shoulders. Um, so, yeah. How difficult has it been 
with the well, the specifically one of the shoulder injuries he had. But uh, you know, but he's carrying a lot of pain now, isn't he? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it's repetitive strain injury, which I think one would have expected. Um, and I think I think he's aching from top to bottom. So yeah, I think race would be a good option. But I don't think he'll race for long, if I know Lewis. <laughs> And this is the longest anybody has ever swum in Channel Swimming Association rules in these temperatures. I think that's right, isn't it? Nonetheless, it's, it's, he's also swum a Norwegian Ford. That was yes. nothing compared with this distance, yeah. mind you. And that was protected on either side by mountains. Yes. This has been absolutely battling the elements. Yes. Who would ever think you want to go on the south side of the Isle of Wight, for example? <laughs> it seems miles out to sea, sometimes 50 kilometres out to sea across Lime yeah. Bay. Can't yeah. see land. Yes. I mean, it's mind-blowing, isn't it, really? It is. And, and, and I think that's... That's what also makes this different from the other expeditions, that it's been every single day slog. You know? so, yeah. He just thanked his crew, actually, and said it was the final push, because we can see him. Too many people on the beach now to yeah. begin to see him, certainly. Um, why is it that somebody like Lewis Pugh can put themselves through this? I know he firmly believes in the protection of the oceans, yes. but some people just have the mentality that they can do this. He came from a naval family, the sea was always able to physically do this and put his mind through it because he's so passionate about what he's doing and he loves the ocean and he he was brought up that way as well to protect what you love and um, yeah and, I, and he's got a very strong mind once he sets himself a goal you know he finishes it well Mark Foster you heard Antoinette there saying that Lewis Pugh has a has a very Welcome strong mind. <laughs> Hello, this is one of our Olympians. He's done five Olympics, oh, and uh, nice he was the you. fastest person in Britain at the age of 15. Oh. So another person who can genuinely swim a very long way. <laughs> put it that way. Yeah, only swam uh, 50 meters. I was world record holder for 50 meters. So this is a little bit further than what I did. But as a kid, I did an awful lot of wow. swimming up and down a pool. So I did a lot, a lot of laps. That's was stunning. he a pool swimmer before he became an endurance swimmer? Um, his first swim was Robin Island. Um, at, the, at, at the age of 17, he had his first started having his first swimming lessons, and I guess it's, he started off in, this, in in a pool, but that's, he did so a Robin Island. Had yeah. an yeah. obsession with sort of open water swimming from an early age. Well, I wouldn't say an obsession, but um, he definitely has enjoyed the, the challenge and been able to use it as a platform to speak about what is truly in his heart. Mm. And he has expressed his concern, hasn't he, that he really hasn't seen enough wildlife out there and that actually what he has witnessed is why he is campaigning. Yes. That actually the evidence he has seen himself now. Yes, it's very sad. Very sad. Yeah. You're, you're obviously very supportive. I am. Because he spends a lot of time have, away from you probably. I have to sometimes do the silent support being left at home <laughs> for weeks on end, which is not much fun. <laughs> so that's why I'm, I'm really grateful that I was able to, to come here for a bit longer and, and be part of it. It's nice, because he said earlier, we were sort of saying about it's not just about him, it's about the team of people around him. Yes. Which clearly he's got the support network exactly. there, but you're exactly. a huge part of that too. Yeah. yeah. We need to have a team. How are you going to occupy him when he gets home? And uh, what treats have you got in store? Because I hear from his chef, he's very into Battenberg cake and Victoria sponge, and I don't know if you'd like to confirm that or not. Well, I now have to compete with Denise's cooking, <laughs> and my cooking <laughs> skills are not great. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll have to maybe go on a couple of courses. Yeah. Denise Wilson, I think, from Chester, is yeah. that right? Yeah. She's done a fine job, cooped up, very small kitchen. Yeah. Eight people have to be fed. Yeah. How long were you on board for, and uh, when... Did you, oh there he is, he's stopped a little bit again, isn't he? He's pacing it, so he arrives okay. just on time, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, how long were you on board for? And were you there for the dungeon bit, which was a, such was. a headache? I was, and that was pretty hectic because we had to take a rib out, we couldn't take the catamaran out because of the, the weather, even though the wind had calmed down. So um, it was quite a ride back, um, quite, quite hectic, but just such a relief to see the end of that 
place. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, to get past it. Yeah, Third time exactly, lucky. Yeah, yeah. You, could, you could hear the frustration yeah. in his voice. He just shouted out again to the crew, how long left, Mark? <laughs> and uh, really, you know, you, pro you probably want to start powering in, don't you, actually, at this point? Yeah, well, if, if he's got a lot, of, a lot of energy left in his arms, probably yes. But at the same time, as we said, it's, it's not about the... It's not been a race. It's, it's been a, a real journey for yes. him. And I think the thing is now, it's sort of... He, I'm only guessing. I'm not in. I'm not in his body or in his mind. But he must be really enjoying this last bit because it's nearly over. As you say, mm. he won't stay still for long. But he'll probably yeah. be out there again. Yeah. But this must mean it must have been a long time in the planning. This, right? Yeah. And you're are you involved in the process or are you just? You... It depends. Um, things change from day to day. So sometimes I don't know the changes. Sometimes I see on Facebook and other. Forms of oh, you're media. From somewhere else. Yeah, because actually he was so tired during the swim that sometimes when I did get to speak to him, all he could say was, "Baby, I'm really tired. I have to go to sleep." And that was quite difficult because he's generally the problem solver for us at home yeah, as but well. He knows you're so, there. Yeah. Just that, that, that hear your voice is one yeah. thing. You've just seen a lot of guys, just some people getting in. Actually, yeah, I think they're going to swim out towards him. Yes, and that's. I mean, we really are very near here to the finish line, aren't we? You can start to see yeah. the bottom you know the support structure for the beach but in the past he said my muscles are achingly sore my tongue has swollen up to chafe against my teeth from the seawater and even coffee tastes like salt he's not really selling it to me i have to say is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he did go through times when it was more difficult to eat uh, he lost his appetite mm. um but denise made sure that that changed so, By making the Battenberg cake. Yeah, yeah and he was supposed to have baked potatoes, wasn't he? I think. Yeah, and looking after him. Really do, you, well. do you swim as well? Do you swim at all? I used to swim, and then I messed up my shoulders in martial arts. So I've actually only just recently started um, okay. swimming again. Okay. But I won't do more than 20, 20 laps in the pool. Okay. I wondered <laughs> if you got in and supported him, but you got in any of the legs. No, not, not the whole day. No. Antoinette, I'm going to turn you around because yeah. there is your husband swimming in. Awesome. I would say about 300 meters to go. Um, I don't know really if you. Exciting. Are you feeling all right? I am. I'm going to hold it together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's very, very emotional, and um, I'm just so happy for everybody, and and everybody that's been involved, and I'm just so happy for all the support that he's got from everybody. Okay. Yeah. Well, Lewis Pugh, you really don't have very far to go. He'll be yeah. looking out, won't he? People are now swimming with him. Can you see? Yeah. That's absolutely <laughs> lovely. I don't know who the, who you are. But you've swum out to bring him in and there's people on the beach now all beginning to point all turning round it's a horrific day down in dover the weather is well it's british what can i say it's absolutely <laughs> horrible but people are still coming down here aren't they to support him there's been a beach yeah. clean going on when the wind was whipping earlier there were tin cans flying around wow. bits of yeah. tissue flying around it's exactly the sorts of thing that lewis is having a beast a, a few a few moments there as he pauses yeah. What will be going through his head right now, Antoinette, as you know him so well? Ooh. Battenberg, though. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, yeah. <laughs> no, but there's a lot of time to think about, the, it's all about the message, right? Yeah, I think so. I think there'll be a lot going through his mind. Probably about, I would, have, I would have said, as you say, a couple of hundred metres left, but how many, you know, that, that in strokes is probably, I don't know, it might sound not an awful lot, but a couple of hundred strokes left when he's done so many. I'm just going to pause this, actually. Let's listen to the cheers as Lewis, you want to go, Antoinette? Yes, go, 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 go and Thank see you him. So much, Thank you so much. You. Well done, anyway. Well, well done. done. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, Bye. Thank you. 
Oh, we won't, won't hear me from here. He, they, they came to, he'll meet them. Uh, no, I think they're, they're just too far in. It wasn't about, oh, I see. It's just buzzed him to pull him out of it. You shout, because you're Lewis! 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 Do that again. Lewis! 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 In a world of his own. Lewis, Lewis, come away from the shore, Stephen says. Come away from the shore. They want you to meet those swimmers. Yeah, I got it, I will. Yeah, there's a group of swimmers there, Lewis. They've come to escort you in. If you swim towards them, mate. Yeah, so Lewis is now swimming along the edge of Shakespeare Beach, the traditional beach where uh, people actually go to France. Uh, he's going to be met by a group of swimmers and they will escort him into the point where he will clamber out. He's hoping to touch the top of the wall and then clamber out at the end of the swim. right down on the beach actually and uh, Lewis Pugh has gone a bit early I have to say because the finish line he's really shallow now and the finish line is about 150 yards down the beach so we're walking now up to where he is to try and grab a word with him because he needs to go through the flags there are specific rules to meet the Channel Swimming Association and they have to well, one thought is he has to touch the harbour wall, but he was told he has to go through two specific flags, which are now quite a long way down there. So we're walking up to try and get to Lewis, who is swum to see the swimmers who've been in the water, patiently waiting for him. And the water temperature, despite the rain today, is actually not that bad. So he had just four kilometres left today, 330 miles, 500 and... Uh, 30 or so kilometres in total that he's made and he is feeling absolutely ecstatic that he's about to finish. 
It's quite a come down though, finishing a huge endurance project like this. He'll have to keep some exercise up. You can't just stop. And he'll certainly need treatment on elements like his shoulder, which have been extremely painful. Shout me if we lose signal, won't you? Because we hadn't planned to be this far up the beach. There he is. In the distance, a large group of swimmers now in the water and plenty of people along the beach. They've been carrying out a beach swim. Plenty of people now coming down to see him because they followed his progress for the last 49 days, writing as he has for Sky News on a blog, talking often about the difficulties that he's faced, not least the jellyfish blooms, the awkwardness of marine traffic. This is such a busy waterway, of course. And even at one point, military firing, a German vessel announced imminent firing and they had to check that they weren't within range. So he's had to contend with all sorts of human problems. Is it nice to see him come in? Fantastic, yeah, brilliant. Did you Great. come down specifically to we see have, him? We have, yes, yes, we have. And enjoyed the litter picking and all sorts. Really good. And inspirational for you, no doubt, to see such an amazing athlete do something like this. He just said he wanted to get yeah. in and start swimming. Do you? Have you got your, have you got your shorts? You could. <laughs> Thank you very much. I can hear the cheers now. I'll listen to that. How do you feel about seeing Lewis Pugh finish? Good. Is it nice to see him come in? Yeah. Have you felt for him? It's been hard work, hasn't it? Mm. Yeah. Is, it, is that why you brought your son down then? Yeah, yeah. We live local, so anything like this, we're, we're involved, yeah. Oh, well, well yeah. done for coming down. Thank you. Big cheers of support now. Listen to that. And Thomas, what a reception he's getting. Well, quite extraordinary pictures there of Lewis Pugh being greeted after 530 kilometers coming up from Land's End. He's greeted by uh, a group of water swimmers like that. That will mean so much to him as he makes these final metres towards the finishing line. He's swimming along the very edge of Shakespeare Beach. It shells very deep, uh, steeply here, which is why he's actually swimming in quite deep water there. But he will be going the full length of the beach and he will be touching the harbour wall. Uh, that is the, the finishing point of his swim. Clamber out onto Shakespeare Beach uh, and he can finally take a rest after 49 days, 530,000 strokes burning 98,000 calories. His body's screaming, but adrenaline, you can see, is keeping those arms pumping. Thomas, I'm gonna to wave to you. I'm just over here, just the other side of Lewis Pugh. Can you see me? Hello. There you are, good to see you. Days at sea for you as well, I know, as Lewis comes in. I mean, it is quite amazing to see so many people uh, down here on Shakespeare Beach, isn't it? I know many of those have been uh, doing a beach clean, sadly, all the way along our coastline these days. We see an awful lot of plastic. And when we were down on Shakespeare Beach uh, a couple of days ago, we did see an awful lot of ensure that uh, we have seas that are from fishing, from drilling and so on. And that is what has motivated him all the way along. But right now, it is a test of endurance. You can see him swimming fast, and that is walking pace uh, that he is swimming at. You can see the people behind him. So it is an extraordinary effort, given that he's been swimming uh, for so long. Uh, and then behind him, it's popped in pan down to his left. You can see the escort of, of uh, swimmers there. Uh, and uh, they are going to follow him all the way in now uh, as he makes this final stretch along the edge of the beach. Yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? They're, they're bobbing neon hats in the water. 
brightly coloured for the open water swimmer. There's plenty of people here now who are following up the beach like I am. I have to say the tide is coming in, so we have to be a little bit careful here. Let me grab a few people. What's it like to see, uh, what's it like to see Lewis Pugh down here? He was doing the interview. He's amazing. Is he amazing? Brilliant course, and he's just done so brilliantly. Absolutely wonderful. So three cheers to him. Yeah, well, good that you've come down on a day like this. Well, absolutely, as well. more people should have come along. It's fabulous. I think the weather might have put some people off. It was awful earlier, it but put him off. <laughs> it doesn't need to put him off, does no, it? No, he's just a star, and for such a good cause. So it's superb. Absolutely superb. Are you local to here? Do you yeah, see? Do you, do you see evidence of the the plastics on the beach that he yeah, talks about? Yeah, absolutely. And, and also, Dover Council needs to stop dredging Goodwin Sands because Sands are needed there for all the wildlife. Well, certainly that's um, a campaign that's ongoing, isn't it? And Michael Gove will no doubt be made aware of that as he's brought down here, certainly. Absolutely. Yeah, brilliant. He needs to take some action. Not just talk, but action. Yeah, indeed. So thank you very much indeed. Tell you what, it's a race up the beach now to keep Lewis Pugh in sight. We talked about him swimming slowly. I'm not so sure he does now, to be honest with you. How are you? <laughs> You've come down to film Lewis Pugh on your camera, have you, today? What's it like to see him? Um, it's cool. I've actually been following it quite closely. My little brother is uh, first mate on, on the yacht. Well, there we are. Yeah. How's he found it? Oh, he's had a brilliant time. Um, it's a great experience. He's obviously met some really cool people. And it's, it's all for a good cause. Is he, was he into boating before, or is this all quite new for him? Um, no, he's into boating. He's, he's sailed almost the whole around the world. Uh, two, two or three years ago now. Um, that's my dad up there. He uh, owns the boat. We've, yeah, hey, we've, that's your boat, is it? Uh, that's my dad's boat, yeah. Your dad's boat? Ah, oh, so, Yeah, we've been sailing for years. Have you? Yeah, it was just, I think it was just fortune that, you know, they stumbled across the website. But yeah, it's been... And applied, yeah. It wasn't really something that I was aware of before. Obviously, been so close to it and following it quite closely, it's, um, it's quite inspiring, really. I think I saw your brother dive in yeah. from the boat at one point. Is that right? Were they yeah. celebrating the halfway point or something? That's exactly what it was. Oh, yeah, I know exactly the photo you're talking about. Yeah, it there've was been some, the halfway point. There have been some really key moments for them. The first 100k, the first 200k, yeah. the halfway point. How important has it been for the whole team to keep those goals? In sight and, and actually encourage you to keep going in what's been such a difficult endurance activity. I don't know, I think it's important to set little goals, not little goals, but it's important to break it up and set goals like that. Um, so like lots of small achievements obviously equal one big difference. Well, give us give a shout out for your brother then. What's his name? Uh, Rowan. Are you proud shout of him as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah, very proud. Yeah, I haven't seen him for oh, the best part of 50 days now, I guess it's been. Yeah, 49. 49, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, we've we've come back to help sail it back to Portsmouth because they're obviously on to their next their next big thing. Yeah. yeah and excited to see him. Big shout out, Rowan. Yeah. Well, well done, first mate Rowan and the team on board. It's hard work, though, isn't it? Being cooped up um, in a team like that, really. It's you know everyone's yeah. got to muddle through because there's some difficult moments where they're debating whether or not to go in the water, what the currents are like, what the sea state is like. Very difficult. Right, we're very near the finish line. What was your name, too? Uh, Pierce. Pierce, thank you very much indeed, and well done to your, well done to your brother. Yeah. Thank you. OK, making our way to the finish line now. Thomas Moore is uh, on board. Hi, Thomas. We're very close to this. You know, you've followed Lewis Pugh in the Arctic. Yeah, sorry. You've, um, you've followed Lewis Pugh in the Arctic and doing this, the long swim. Fantastic to see Lewis coming in for the final few metres. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's like this. You know, it means so much to Lewis. We really appreciate all the support that you've had on social media.
cheering now they're absolutely delighted for him and they are so supportive of his cause i'm breathless lewis you swim too fast on, why are you shouting out ah uh, because he's gonna land any moment now uh I'm pleased to see him back yes no it's a long swim and it's been a hard swim as well but it's doing fantastic work publicizing plastic in the oceans I'm wondering if he's going all the way to the harbour wall, actually. French Let's find stop. out. French stop! <laughs> yes, don't stop in France, definitely not. Is it good to see him? Absolutely, wonderful. Wonderful. I mean, he doesn't even look tired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he is, though. <laughs> Amazing, hasn't he done well? He'll keep moving through. There's young girls here, too. There's a lot of children come down. He's gone all the way to the harbour wall. Well, you know, Hayden Welcher, we spoke to earlier, who had tried to do it, setting off from here and finishing at Portland Bill, he kept reminding us to remind Lewis that he had to touch the harbour wall for Channel Swimming Association rules. And look, he's going to do just that. He touched the harbour wall, he turned round and he's swimming back where two flags are waiting for him and a finish line that reads the long swim. It's been a long swim. It's been an incredible feat of endurance. But Lewis Pugh, you're a record holder now. Congratulations. Hello, Anna. How are you? See you in a moment. You're going up, I know, to cross the finish line. Can we be the first to say you've done brilliantly? Thank you. So How much. are you feeling right now? <laughs> Exhausted and exhilarated in equal measure. It's not even easy to get up the beach, is it? No, it isn't. Anyway, I'll let you do this. Now. I'll talk to you in a moment. Thank you. Well done, Lewis. Congratulations. Woo! Yay! Amazing people. Well done. Well done. Well done. Thank you. 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 Thank you to take the health of our oceans very, very seriously and protect them fully, start fully protecting large sections of this coastline, but also around the world.
What are you doing to your body putting yourself through this? Yeah, it's it's been robust. You know, it's now been for for 50 days. My shoulders are absolutely exhausted. My whole team is exhausted, but we're here. We made it. When I started out, I didn't know whether it was possible, but uh, we've made it. Yeah, well, well done, well done. What was the hardest bit for you? I know you've talked in the past about there are pioneers and there are followers, and yeah. if you're a pioneer, you have weeks of worry. Did the worry that you had, did that spell out into the reality that you, that you felt? This was a sort of two halves. The beginning was nice and easy and warm and flat. When, once I'd hit... Uh, once I had hit the Isle of Wight, from that moment onwards, it was storm after storm after storm. And getting around Dungeness was one of the toughest jobs I've ever had to undertake. Your wife is here. I know oh, you wanted to see her. OK. Hello, Ed. Hello. She brings you a towel. <laughs> Fantastic. Can we all have one? <laughs> Oh, well, what will you do now? We all want to know, because it's very hard to wind down from a project as big as this, isn't it? Yes, it is, but now the real work actually begins. I mean, obviously, I'm exhausted. I'd like to have a nice, good rest and a very, very good sleep, but very, very soon uh, I go off to the G7 summit. Uh, the, the, the discussions which are taking place at the G7 summit are about protecting our oceans. That's going to be a top of the agenda. Also, then we've got the High Seas Convention coming up where all the nations of the world are coming together and saying, how can we protect the waters beyond our national jurisdictions? That's going to involve a lot of hard work and a lot of bridge building between the nations. Well, congratulations. Your hard work begins. I have to say, for me, the jellyfish would have put me off at the start. You got stung almost instantly. But as a sign you've said, that's an indicator species, exactly what you're talking about. We found so many jellyfish all over the place. And, and what the jellyfish are telling us, well, is, is that the oceans are warming. So they're an indication that the, that the, the oceans are warming because of climate change, but also because of overfishing. Um, yeah. Michael Gove, you're there. Come and say congratulations yourself. Come and say Thank hello. You. Thank you so much. Here's the Environment Secretary coming in to say congratulations to you. Uh, oh, that's lovely. A flag brought in as well. There we go. Oh, yeah. What do you think? I think Lewis is amazing. I think he's a modern-day hero. I think everything that he's done is just so inspirational. Um, I think the long swim has really brought to everyone's attention how important our seas are and how important it, all, it is for all of us to do our bit to protect them, to restore them to health, um, and to make sure that this amazing environmental resource is there for future generations. And Lewis's courage, his grit, uh, his amazing dedication, I think, is an example to us all. So what is your message to environment secretaries like Michael Gove here in the UK and elsewhere? You're heading off to New York, obviously. What do you want to say? Well, it's an opportunity now for Britain really to lead. Uh, at the moment, in terms of global leadership, there's a vacuum in terms of protecting our oceans. I think this is a natural place for Britain to be in terms of protecting our oceans, not only here around the UK, but also our overseas territories. I'd like uh, Michael to be going to the G7 summit and showing the other G7 nations and also in the United Nations that we talk the talk, that, we, that when it comes to ocean protection, we do the job. It's very, very difficult for us to be encouraging other nations to, to do the same thing if we in Britain are not leading. Lewis is right. Um, we've already taken some steps to protect the waters around, uh, around this country, but there is more that we need to do, and there's more that we also need to do in order to, to galvanise a global coalition, in order to make sure that our oceans are purged of plastic, but more broadly, that we also have more protected areas in which we, we stop the exploitation of our seas and allow nature to recover. But we only have three fully uh, non-exploitable parts of, of the UK water, don't we? Lundy Island, Arran, a small part of Yorkshire. Only three. It's not really doing anything, is it? More needs to be done. You're right that more needs to be done. We've already said that there will be more marine protected areas and more marine conservation zones around the UK. Do you think UK. that will really genuinely do it? Do you, are, you, are you convinced that's actually the point? Because sometimes you're protecting one species from one specific activity in a small area. You need to protect the whole ecosystem and the whole habitat. I think there's always got to be a balance which is struck in order to make sure that coastal communities can continue to fish, but in a sustainable way. And, and one of the lessons of Lewis's uh, swim is that we will only ensure that we have a uh, fishing industry in the future if we make sure that we have sustainable resources now. And it's striking that balance, which it's important we all do, and we have to do it globally. We have to recognise that there are some parts of our seas and oceans which need to be completely protected, which should be no-take zones. There are other areas where the right sort of fishing can carry on, provided it's sustainable. 
sustainable and environmentally sensible. I mean, we've seen scallop wars. While you've been in the water, there have been battles off the coast of Normandy, <clears throat> fighting over the scraps of what's left of the scallop industry there. And these are fishermen being attacked, British fishermen being attacked. Yeah, so it's yeah. exactly what you're talking about. It's a very, very interesting thing. You know, Desmond Tutu always says when we damage the environment, we create conditions ripe for conflict. And so, so many of the conflicts which are taking place around the world today are taking place as a result of, 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 of a conflict over limited resources. And he also says that when we protect the environment, we foster peace. Uh, so when I see images of British fishermen and French fishermen fighting, I think to myself, we really have to do absolutely everything now to protect the environment, to avoid this type of conflict with our neighbours here in France. It's a real concern for the government to see stuff like that as well, isn't it? It's deeply concerning. My heart goes out to all the fishermen who've been caught up in this. Um, as you know, and I'm from a fishing background myself, um, and I do have enormous sympathy. Uh, and I think it's important that we, as we are doing, talk to the French government, make sure that those fishermen who are fishing legally are protected as they go about their work. And we also need to make sure that in the future we've got the right regime in order to ensure exactly as Lewis says that we have healthy and sustainable resources for for the future we're talking about uh, the politics of, of scallop fishing and here you are not even feeling the cold I don't no, think no, you I, ever I, feel I, the cold. I, I am I am feeling the cold are you? Yes, yes I feel that you need to go and get what's your favorite food uh, well it's range I started on chocolate and then then it was potatoes and for the last I don't know, four weeks it's been hot cross buns. Hot cross buns, and it's not even Easter. I think we need to get you a hot cross bun. Lewis yeah. Pugh, it's amazing to, to see what you've done. I have to say, you'd have lost me on jumping in. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can all probably say that. None of us would really like to do that. But uh, how do you feel about having finally completed what has been a long-held goal of yours to swim the English Channel and become a record breaker? It, it, it's an absolute relief, but just remembering this wasn't about breaking records. This was, this was not about swimming. This was about trying to convey a message to people here around the UK that we have a very, very precious resource and that we must protect it for not only our generation, but most importantly for future generation and also for the animal kingdom. How did he do, everyone? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Lewis Pugh, well done. Everyone wants to say hello. Let's just watch. Michael Gove, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Well done. Everybody wants a photo now. Everybody wants to come and congratulate him. There he is with Hayden Welsh, the man who didn't quite make it. How do you feel now, Hayden, having seen him finish? You know what? There's a lot of salt water out there, but I've got a lot more in my eyes right now. Are you feeling uh, a little bit emotional to see this? It was wonderful to see it finish. It's an emotional, no doubt, for his family as well. well Hayden Welsh, I know you got about halfway, didn't you? About halfway, a bit, a bit further than halfway. Yeah, I got about halfway. Yeah. yeah. Will you have another go yourself, do you think? Not doing this channel, but there are others out there. Okay. Others out there for Lewis Pugh, too, no doubt. Uh, he's done the polar extremes, hasn't he? He swam the Norwegian fjords. I want his towel, as you can see. And you've been swimming, too. Well I done, have, yes! yes. Yes, um, I'm a, a coach for Channel Swimmers here in, in, De in Dover. So we're out here all the time swimming. And as a coach for Channel Swimmers, how do you feel about what's, what he's achieved? It's the most awesome thing. One, he's campaigning for a, a fantastic cause. We've got far too much pollution in our oceans. And it's such an epic journey. This is history. We're, we're here in the middle of history. It's fantastic. And I understand that 30% of channel swimmers finish uh, with uh, one kilometre to go. Is that right? Yeah. There's and is it the tides and the currents that make it difficult? When swimmers are coming into Cap Grenade, there's a terrible tide that they go through and it's really very, very difficult for them to cross there. Um, a, a lot of them give up at that point um, because of the tides and they're really exhausted. Um, this gentleman actually had a go. He's just um, been out in the channel. He's, yeah. he's autistic. Um, this is Bruce Zhang. Hello. He did 11 and a half hours, but he's actually um, a conservationist as well. Yes, quite right. I care really deeply about the trees in the Amazon rainforest and even the British uh, forests uh, very much, and I don't like to see pl plastic polluting our oceans. I'm very passionate about that, and I also care for the best that Jeremy Corbyn wins the next general election, but I won't talk <laughs> too much about politics right now. <laughs> you did it already. Well, good luck to you. I hope you 
manage to finish it one day. Congratulations. Say, most importantly, the world needs to be a better place, and that's all that matters. Absolutely. Couldn't agree Thank with you, you more. Mark Foster is here, a British Olympic swimmer, world record holder at a number of distances, but not 330 miles, Mark. No, definitely not. And I'm now going to be the, not a record holder, an umbrella holder just for you. Oh, it's, too, it's too late for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, listen, I've been blo I've blown away by what he's done, but also everybody coming out and supporting, and also by him, Lewis, doing what he's done, this challenge today, it's highlighting what a serious problem there is. So without him doing what he's done, we, won't, we don't get to speak about these things. And it's all about the little ones, isn't it? Hello, Hello, you've come out to see, have you? Hi. Did you want to come and see Lewis? Yeah, we, um, we're we keen um, sailors ourselves, so we want the ocean to be clean and we totally support what he's done. It's quite a long swim. And it is all about inspiring the young people. Lewis Pugh talks about everybody being a multiplier. One person tells one person, another person tells another person. And it is all about getting young children to understand from an early age, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because it's their future at the end of the day that we're ruining by littering the beaches. I know. Plastic toys, they're attractive, aren't they? It's very yeah. difficult. It's hard work, isn't it? Um, certainly, this is all about the campaign. Very important to have a goal. One, he had to finish it. Two, he wanted his message to get out there. And seeing the people down here, the Environment Secretary as well, who we called over to talk to him too, he's doing just that, isn't he? Yes, and let's just hope that it does make a difference. I mean, he clearly has highlighted it, but then it's up to us or it's up to governments to actually do something about it. So, yes, and I think it's a phenomenal what he's done, but now the, now the real effort starts. And we say this every time, but nothing seems to change, so something needs to change. And all of us, you know, many children on their summer holidays right now, they'll go on holiday, perhaps swim in the sea. None of us can conceive of doing that. I mean, maybe you can. Because you're a swimmer. <laughs> but what, doing what he's done, you mean? Oh, no, I can't even begin to understand what he's put himself through. No, I, I think the thing is, it's, it's amazing the, the human body and the human spirit, isn't it? When you set, set your mind on doing something. And can anyone do it? Absolutely not. But then people do do it. And I think the thing is, people only do do it once they set out to, 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 to achieve something. And his, his achievement is his personal achievement. But the bigger picture here is, every day when he's been getting in and out, he's highlighting the problems that we do have. So... Uh, uh, human beings are remarkable, but we need to do... I love watching people go past in all their swimming trunks, actually. Because <laughs> it's there. not warm, let's be honest about it. I've seen a lot of people today that have been talking about their swimming the channel. One lady swimming the channel tomorrow that's got one leg, and another guy who's going to swim at the weekend. So, um, no, he's inspiring a lot, of, a, a lot of people to do amazing things. And I think here with me now is Otto Thanning, is that right? So Otto Thanning is another record holder. Is the oldest man to swim the channel at the age of 73 and is planning to do it again at the age of... 77. 77. Well, well done you. And I know that you're very close to Lewis Pugh, that he yes. became... You became a bit of a father figure to him yes, after well, his father I died. I met him when he was 18 for the first time. We swam together for up until now, and then we did the channel for the first time, both of us, uh, in the early 90s. So we have a long association, and I'm a great admirer of him. Do you feel a bit like a proud dad today? Oh, very. Very. Avi, as someone who has swum the channel, it's the oldest person to ever swim the channel, and I know you did it to show what people over the age of 70 could do. You didn't necessarily do it for any other reasons. No, I'm not a record man, but I'm trying to show in my uh, profession that people, if you look after yourself, you can do things that people don't expect, and uh, I think it's very important. So you've managed to swim the 21 miles of the channel. He's done 330 miles. Yeah. It's just it's beyond. almost beyond... Yeah. I swam quite a bit with him. I was on the boat, so I was allowed to swim behind him and sort of follow him and give him a bit of help and stayed on the boat. It was a fantastic experience, really wonderful. But he's driven. I mean, he is one of those very, very exceptional people who doesn't matter what the odds are, he finds a way. So I think we're very fortunate to have a person like that campaigning for what he is doing. And the way was hard, wasn't it? You know, you talk about the jellyfish, the tides, yeah. the marine traffic, the current helping or hindering. Felt like swimming uphill or swimming downhill. The sea state. I mean, all of it was thrown at him. Very much so. But he had a symbol, a most remarkable crew of people. Photographers, 
biokineticists, cooks. Ah, absolutely brilliant. Top of the line, every one of them. Super. And you have to give a shout out for the team because the logistics of something like this are not easy, are they? Tremendously difficult. And then to have 10 people living on a boat in a very small confined place and keeping peace, that's something. 50 days, imagine it. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful stuff. Otto Thanning, thank you very much indeed. When are you planning to do your next go, by the way? Uh, that's a secret, but soon. Secret, okay. Hopefully. Might you be 78 when you try it? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> we wish you the very best of luck. Thank Otto you. Thanning, who currently is the oldest person to swim the channel at the age of 73 and is planning to do it again. Just a quick word from people here. How do you all feel that he did? Oh, amazing. Oh, Absolutely right. fantastic. Really? Yeah. Oh, good, yeah. I was on board with him all day yesterday. Oh, were you? How come? Yeah, well, he invited me on board. As Any a, reason? Does he know you? Yeah, as, yeah, I was a channel swimmer in 1960 and 1966. Well done. Uh, representing the Channel Swimming Association, he invited myself and another guy, Keith Oiler, along for the ride, so to speak. Hello. Yeah, it was terrific. Terrific. And so you know, as much as he, uh, as he does, how hard it is to swim in open water like this, and genuine open water, you know, 50 kilometres out to sea across Lime Bay, for example, no land in sight. Oh, well, 30 miles from land. Across Lime Bay, yeah, that that's rough and tough out there because you get eddies and backwaters and goodness knows what. But uh, he was up for it. He was up for the job. Man Mountain, isn't he? Man Mountain. There we are. Yeah. Lewis Pugh, Man Mountain. The human polar bear. You know, that's nickname, <laughs> don't you? No, but that's actually almost literally true, isn't it? Well, you know, swimming in the Arctic and the Antarctic that he's done. That's how he achieved that nickname, the human polar bear. And driven on by the message. It's like a warm bath. From, from I know. Well, it, didn't they say it was about 18 degrees, I think? Yeah. That's... 12 degrees off Lizard Point would have had me yeah. done, I think, probably. <laughs> I'll give you an, uh, an instance of global warming, right? When I swam the channel in 1960, it was 58. This is 63, 64. There's a difference. Global warming. No other reason for it. And did I read that there's only 2,331 people who have ever swum the Channel Tunnel? Does that sound about right? Swam the Channel Tunnel? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll work Sw swam tunnel. the Channel. <laughs> I'm going to rush off and do that. I might be the first. <laughs> <laughs> On a day like this, it might be possible, I tell you. Yeah. Question. <laughs> have more people climbed Mount Everest or swam the English Channel? <laughs> channel. I read that. Good luck. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. I'm glad you joined uh, him on board yesterday. More people have climbed Mount Everest. Well, there we are. Maybe not now. They might be inspired. So, Lewis Pugh, he's in the distance now giving other interviews. He's come onto dry land. Day 49, he managed to achieve what some had deemed the impossible within his time frame of 50 days. He is the only person, perhaps will only be the only person, to ever swim the full length of the English Channel starting off there in Cornwall across all those difficult headlands Lizard Point the first one Dungeness nearly got him off the coast of Kent but he has made it landing here on Shakespeare Beach in Dover Lewis Pugh the long swim for you is over now it's time for rest let's look at some of his best bits is divided between pioneers and followers. Uh, pioneers do not know whether they're going to be successful in, the, in their quest. Uh, I hoped, I prayed that I could do it.